Well, good morning again, and Happy New Year. Welcome 2023. And as we turn together to God's Word, as we turn to the Bible this morning, we're returning to our series, uh, focusing on and considering Christ's coming. We don't just have to do that on Christmas Day. We should consider that all the time. And uh, you may remember that over the past several weeks, we've gazed together with wonder uh, that leads right into worship, by the way, uh, as we've considered different biblical perspectives looking on Christ's coming. And you might say that we've looked at at the events that Christmas celebrates, that we've looked at Christ's coming through different biblical perspectives or out of different windows, so to speak, uh, different passages in, in God's Word. And we've returned again and again to the words of 1 John 4 and verse 14. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Now, this morning, I'd just like you to think with me of kind of a, a picture here, and it's the difference between a panoramic photograph uh, on the one hand and a close-up photo uh, on the other. Now, of course, uh, uh, panoramic photos show much, much more than, than close-ups. Uh, a panoramic photograph you might describe as a big picture picture. Uh, it kind of shows the whole scene. Whereas a close-up zooms in on only a very small, but normally very, very important part of the big picture. Now with that in mind, kind of thinking about the difference between a a big picture or a panorama on the one hand, and then a a, a zoomed-in close-up on the other, I want to step back and both ask and answer the question together, uh, the question that's also the title of a great Christmas carol, What Child Is This?, Uh, Think with me, just over 2,000 years ago, the angelic host announced the Savior's birth to the shepherds as they were in the fields surrounding Bethlehem. And they, of course, uh, announced, uh, the angels announced the birth of the Savior. And the shepherds then hurried off to Bethlehem to find Jesus lying in the manger, and they were the first to welcome the Savior. Uh, They found him in the manger just as they had been told. Now, I would like to suggest that that's a close-up. Uh, And this morning, I want to turn to the first words of the Gospel of John. And in in doing so, we're going to turn from a close-up to uh, what might be described as the panoramic picture of the Bible. Uh, The first 18 verses of the Gospel of John are called the prologue by scholars. Think introduction. And these words will gaze on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's exactly where they look. Uh, But it's not a close-up. It's the greater picture. Uh, So we're adjusting the telescope, so to speak, and we're looking at the big picture with wonder and amazement and answering the question. We're posing the question and then answering it. What child is this? Kind of imagine, on the one hand, looking at a close-up, looking uh, through a telescope focused on a planet or one specific star in the night sky, And and that's a wonderful picture, right? But then just setting aside the telescope and just gazing into the big picture and trying to see the whole scene. And and that's what we want to do this morning. And I'm absolutely convinced uh, that this will be valuable if this is the first time that you've done this or if this is the 10,000th time. Uh, Let's begin looking at the first five verses of the Gospel of John. Hear these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Uh, These verses show us who Jesus is by bridging from before creation to Christ's coming. And the only fitting response is one of worship. These verses build that bridge all the way back, from all the way back before creation to Christ's coming, and that confronts us with the significance of Christ's coming. Uh, And the story is much, much, much bigger than Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. And, And right away, we come to the words, in the beginning was the word. And you might hear how this echoes how the Bible itself begins in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
And notice that this is Word, capital W. The Word is eternal. But but that's not all. We're told uh, more vitally important details about the Word. We read, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so here we see the Word is eternal, preexistent. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Listen again to those two verses that begin the Gospel of John. This is an earthquake of glorious truth. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. That's an earthquake. Now think with me, we're going to come back to that, but think with me for just a minute. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke begin with accounts of Jesus' birth, what we know as the traditional Christmas story. Think Mary, Joseph, shepherds, angels, wise men, or magi, depending on how you translate it. That's Matthew and Luke. Mark skips over uh, all accounts of Jesus' birth and childhood and begins with the launch of Jesus' public ministry, marked by his baptism by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And the Gospel of John does something entirely different altogether. Think about it. It goes back to before the beginning of time to explain the earth-shattering significance of Christ's coming. Let's just unpack what's here. Did you catch what is claimed? We read, the Word was with God. This compact statement points to the triune nature of God. One God eternally existing in a loving unity of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These words don't tell us all the details of the Trinity, but many of the building blocks are right here. These words imply personality and coexistence within the Godhead. And then comes the statement, the Word, capital W, was God. God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, the Word, has always been, is, and will always be fully God. The Word was with God, and the Word was God back before the beginning began. Now hear this, and this is essential. Throughout church history, Uh, there has been a phrase that has been vitally important to be embraced, which is taught right here. There was never a time when he was not. Uh, Let me say that again. There was never a time when he was not. And false teachers get this wrong all the time. If you go back in uh, early church history, it was a man named Arius, who uh, his teaching is now popularized by those the followers of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they say that there was a time when God the Son was not. And to that we insist, no, there was never a time when He was not. The second person of the Trinity, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Word, has always been, is, and will always be fully God. Like I said, this is an earthquake. John begins with a theological earthquake showing us the significance of Christ's coming. Next, you you say, well, that's a lot. It doesn't stop. It doesn't let up for a minute. Next, we come to the truth that the Word is the Creator. Listen to verse 3. All things were made through Him. That's a powerful statement. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So it actually says it twice, two different ways. In in case we didn't get the point the first time. Hebrews uh, says the same thing in Hebrews 1-2, the book of Hebrews beginning, But in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. So we need to go back to the beginning uh, to grasp what was happening that night in Bethlehem, right? Right? All of, a sudden, all of a sudden, the significance starts to come into focus. Now, think with me here. I was an engineering student when I came to realize and, and to begin to understand how massively impactful uh, some of what this says truly is. And, and I pondered this for years, but think with me. 
we can ultimately believe in the beginning was the Word, or we can believe in the beginning were the particles. And what we believe will influence or touch absolutely everything. We could call it this way. We say it's a worldview issue. It's a, it's a fundamental watershed decision that what we believe about this will determine what we believe about just about everything. In the beginning was the word, or in the beginning were the particles. If we believe in the beginning was the word, we're accountable to our creator. We have a purpose, and there's meaning to life. You go back a couple of uh, decades, very famous book, the title is probably the best part of it, famous book, The Purpose Driven Life. What a bestseller. If there is, in the beginning was the word, we have a purpose. And that whole book's point was to unpack that you have a purpose and your purpose is found in your relationship with God. And, and the title really makes that point. And we could see that society was looking for that because it's, it was on a New York Times bestseller for a long time. If, on the other hand, it's in the beginning were the particles, were nothing more than cosmic coincidences. And there's no meaning or purpose to life. And there's also no objective base, basis for morality. It's survival of the fittest because we're nothing more or less than unlikely, meaningless accidents of purposeless, random forces. And you say, that's depressing. Indeed it would be. The words, in the beginning was the word, change everything. And with that in mind, listen, I'm going to jump down to the first part of verse 14. We're going to come to this a little bit later. But it says this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But continuing through the passage, so the word came. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas. But keeping moving in verses 4 and 5, the focus is on the glorious news and theme of the light shining in the darkness. And Jesus, who is himself the light of the world, has come. And the theme of the cosmic struggle between light and darkness runs throughout the Gospel of John. And I ought to quickly point out that some translations say, the darkness has not overcome it, that's the light. While other translations say, uh, the darkness has not understood it, talking about the light. And scholars debate which is the right translation. Some even suggest that it could mean both, that it's a double meaning, overcome and understood. I won't unpack all the details, but I am personally convinced that overcome is the best translation. In the struggle between light and darkness, darkness has not overcome the light. And this is tremendously good, even glorious news. Worth pausing and reflecting on. Worth pondering. The darkness has not, and let me take it a step farther, cannot overcome the light. That is very, very, very good news. Now let's keep moving and look, uh, looking at verses 6 through 9 if you're following along in John chapter 1 in your Bible. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, there's that theme of the light again, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Christ's coming demands a response, one way or the other. And we all need to ask and answer the question, what's my response? So remaining on the theme of light and darkness, we see that John the Baptist was a witness pointing to the true light. John the Baptist, of course, was sent ahead of Christ to prepare the way for him in perfect fulfillment of prophecy. And actually, we see John the Baptist baptizing Jesus at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, and that's the event that really begin, it marks the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, or very close to it anyway. And note, this is John the Baptist, not John the Apostle, who wrote the Gospel. And John's role was to point people to the light. His role was to point people to the one who is himself the light of the world. And let's be clear and uncomfortably honest for a moment. The world is a dark place. And if you doubt that, look into your own hearts and see the struggles with sin that, that abound even within us. And then turn on 
whatever your favorite news outlet is for 30 seconds. And you'll see that the world is a dark place full of rebellion against its creator. Now there's hope, and we're going to come to that, but we have to see the reality first, the glooming reality, before we are prepared to embrace the glorious news of the hope. And the gloomy reality is the world is full of rebellion against its creator. And Jesus himself, of course, claims in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then in John 12, 46, he says this, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. That is very good news because the world is a dark place. The light shines in the darkness and it compels a response. And a response is the dividing line between eternal life and divine wrath. Let's keep moving, turning to verses 10 through 13. It says this, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. There are different responses to Christ's coming, friends. One response is rejection, and we see this in verses 10 and 11. And the other response is receiving him, and we see that in verses 12 and 13. And remember, Christ came to his creation. Remember verse 3? He says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1.16 says the same thing in different words. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Everyone is morally responsible to the word because the word made them. But that's not all. He came to those who had the Old Testament scriptures that point directly to him. But he was rejected. And I don't think we're prepared to grasp the offense of the rejection. Pause and think about God's prom uh, promises to Abraham and David, fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or all the prophecies, uh, some of which we read on Christmas Eve, pointing forward to the Christ who would come. Friends, think with me. We find it distasteful when children dishonor their parents. And we tell them, come on, they're your mom and dad. And God commands that we honor our parents. I mean, it's actually in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20 and verse 12. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. But the offense here is infinitely more than dishonoring one's parents. It's the rejection of our Creator, and that's what sin is, rejection of our Creator. Sin is turning our back on our Creator. It's rebellion against our Creator and with all the absolute ugliness of sin fresh in our minds, verses 11 and 12 say, He came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him, but to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Now, don't misquote what's said here. This does not say that everyone's a child of God, as the popular but wrong phrase claims, we're all God's children after all. Only those who receive him become members of God's family. And those who reject God's gift seal their own doom. John 3.36 puts it this way, very clearly. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. We have indeed all been lovingly created in the image of God. And there's dignity for every person because of that, because we all bear the image of God. But only those who receive Jesus Christ become children of God. There's a razor thin dividing line between eternal life and divine wrath. And the dividing line is our response to the person 
and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 12 tells us that everyone who receives him becomes a child of God. The letter of 1 John, chapter 5 and verse 12, puts it this way. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. We are sinners. The Bible is 100% clear about this. Ever since Adam and Eve rebelled in the Garden of Eden, the default human condition has been open rebellion against an alienation from God. We are all sinners needing to be saved. And that's why the Word became flesh. He came to save. And we have to personally receive the Savior's gift. It's not applied by default. We need to place our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we must receive Him. Then turning to verses 14 through 18 keeping in mind everything we've just talked about, about the Word. Hear this. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This is He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because He was before me. For from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. Friends, we're not stuck making guesses about who God is. Jesus supremely reveals God to us. I said we're talking about some uh, truth that is an earthquake today. That's another earthquake. We're not stuck making guesses about who God is. Jesus supremely reveals God to us. The incarnation is the theological term pointing to the glorious truth that God the Son became human for the purpose of our salvation. The glorious truth of the incarnation is that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. The Word, capital W, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now consider the Word became flesh. Verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. Think about it. The eternal, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere present, took to Himself a human nature. Why? For the purpose of our salvation. And in verse 14... It says the only Son, and the word that is translated only in the ESV is translated one and only in the New International Version. And it is a word that isn't used all that much, actually, in the New Testament, but it's also found in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only, or one and only, depending how you translate it, Son. The idea is only, one of a kind, unique. The Word became flesh to save us from our sins. This is the culmination of these verses, and you might want to underline these words. This perfectly describes what Christmas is all about. This answers the question, what child is this? And the language of dwelling among us actually echoes a rich Old Testament picture. Uh, anybody remember the tabernacle in the wilderness? The tent of meeting, before there was a temple, there was a tabernacle, and it was uh, made specifically according to instructions that God gave Moses on the mountain. And the tabernacle was at the center of the camp, and it was the place that was symbolic of God dwelling with his people, right? Well, actually, when it says the word became flesh and dwelled among us, the word dwelled is tabernacled, if I could use a kind of a, a creative word. Uh, it means pitched his tent, but it actually echoes specifically uh, the word tabernacle. The word tabernacled with us, and it's echoing that rich Old Testament imagery of God dwelling with His people. What child is this? Well, with verse 14 in mind, listen to verse 18. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. 
The New International Version translates verse 18 a little bit differently. It gets the sense. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. The point is simple yet incalculably important. If we want to know who God is, we need to look to Jesus. We need to look to the Word, capital W, who became flesh. Because of the Incarnation, we're not stuck guessing about who God is and what He requires of us. God has revealed Himself. Now think with me, without the Bible to tell us who about Jesus, we could know we have a Creator, right? Psalm 19.1 actually says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork. So when we look at the wonder of creation, we could know we have a Creator, and we should be able to figure that out. The Bible is very clear about that. We could know that there is a God and know that we're accountable to Him, but we wouldn't know how to worship Him, and we, wouldn't, we would know that we're accountable, but we wouldn't know how to be saved. Just pause and ponder and imagine how scary that would be. To know that we're accountable to our Creator, that we're accountable to God, but to have no idea who He is and what He requires is a terrifying proposition indeed. But that's not the case because God has supremely revealed Himself to us in His Son. If you like the theological categories, Bible instruction students, you might remember this. This is the difference between general revelation on the one hand and special revelation on the other. General revelation is in creation, and it tells us there is a God, but it's insufficient to save. It doesn't tell us enough. Special revelation, God has revealed himself in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his Son, and how do we know who Jesus is? We look right here in his inerrant, inspired word. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.16 says this about God, whom no one has ever seen or can see. God is invisible. But through the Incarnation, God has supremely revealed Himself to us. And friends, this is incredibly, incalculably glorious news. We're not left guessing about who He is and what He requires. But there's more. God has identified with us. Now, I want to pick up what I think is a common and deeply mistaken, terribly wrong view, and I want to show how the Incarnation answers it. I think, I'm convinced that we often wrongly view God as 10 million miles away and distant and uninvolved. It's a heresy throughout history, actually. It's totally wrong. But we can find ourselves tempted to think or feel like that God doesn't understand our struggles and heartaches more often than we'd like to admit. I won't ask for a show of hands, but have you been there? The feeling is, I, I believe there's a God, I believe that He created me, but I don't feel like He understands what I'm going through. Friends, it's not true. God has identified with us, and he never wonders what we're facing feels like. He understands. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus came to this sin-sick fallen world to be born of a virgin and raised in a relatively poor family from an out-of-the-way town. We know that Mary and Joseph's, about Mary and Joseph's economic position because the offering at the temple in Luke chapter 2 was the offering of the poor. And Nazareth was the short end of all the jokes about 2,000 years ago. Oh, you're from Nazareth. I'm not saying that's good, but I'm just saying that was the reality. We even see that in the Bible. People wrongly made fun of Nazareth. I'm convinced that the barrier for a lot of people to receiving Jesus Christ is the feeling that God doesn't understand my struggles, heartache, and pain. Have you encountered that? Someone, God doesn't get what I'm going through. And we must biblically insist that this is absolutely not true. God never wonders what that feels like. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, all of this brings us to a question. How do I personally need to respond to the glorious message of the Word made flesh? Talk of a Savior implies that someone is in peril needing to be saved, and that's all of us. Our default human condition is war with God. 
We're sinners deserving death and completely unable to save ourselves by our own power. But God sent His Son into the world to save sinners. Verse 12, But to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. And the idea of receiving here is more than intellectual assent. It certainly includes that, but it's more. It's it's this idea of personal trust and faith. The words are related. It's a personal relationship. And of course, that drives that question. What's my response to the Savior? Am I a committed follower of Jesus Christ? Friends, if yes, praise God. Be sure to reflect with joy on all that God has done for us in sending His Son. We ought to respond with worship. He is worthy of all of our worship. In looking at the prologue of the Gospel of John, these first 18 verses, the only fitting response is to worship. But maybe you can't say that you're a committed follower of Jesus Christ. You haven't received Him personally as your Savior. Today could be the day. Pray. Tell Him in your own words that you're a sinner and ask Him to save you. Tell Him that you're placing your faith, your belief, your trust in Him and Him alone to save you. Tell Him that you're surrendering your life to Him. And if you're not ready to take this step, commit to search for the truth. Pick up the Bible, turn to the New Testament, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and read all about Jesus. And I trust that as you search, soon you will be ready to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this New Year's Day, having reflected with wonder on Christ's coming, and having just gazed with wonder on the gospel together, let's turn together to the Lord's table and celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Hear these words from 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, please participate with us this morning. But please be honest with yourself and with God. This is only for those who are followers of Jesus. And if you're not yet ready, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're not yet ready to personally proclaim Christ's death as your substitute and all its benefits personally, we're glad you're here and we look forward to the day when you can honestly proclaim that you believe in Him, that you believe that He died as your substitute and rose again. But until that's true for you, please personally refrain. And perhaps, as I said, in these moments, as we pray, as the elements are passed, you need to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus this morning and begin that personal relationship. Tell him you're a sinner and ask him to save you. Those words, 1 Corinthians 11, 26, describe what we're celebrating. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes we're looking back to the cross and to christ's death as our substitute and forward in expectation of christ's promised and glorious return and friends on a new year's day we're reminded we're a year closer to his coming now as we in a moment i'm going to pray and then we're going to pass the bread and then we'll pass the juice and please wait until everyone is served And then we'll eat together and then drink together as a church family. Uh, But as the bread and then the cup are passed, there'll be some background music playing. Take this to be a time to just pause and ponder that glorious truth. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Pause and ponder some of the glorious truth of Christ's coming. And respond with an appropriate attitude of thankfulness and worship. If the Lord lays on the reality that there's sin in your life that needs to be confessed, take the time to confess that quietly in your heart. And rejoice 
that we have a Savior who stood in our place so that we do not have to bear the penalty for our, that our sins deserve. And allow this to be a wonderful time this New Year's Day of beginning this new year, celebrating on the center of everything the wonder of the gospel, the wonder of Christ's coming. Uh, please pray with me, and then I'll invite the servers to come forward, and there'll be some music as well. Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to gaze with wonder on the gospel this morning. Help us uh, to see the glorious truth, Heavenly Father, that you sent your Son to save us and impress truth that we know deeply into our hearts and call us to respond in worship. Meet us, Holy Spirit, where each of us are individually. And may this be a wonderful time of gazing back to the cross and forward, Lord Jesus, to your promised return. May we live lives of worship. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.